So, second talk, Andrew Chignel, what's the norm of ascent for Kant and how is it grounded? Anyway. Okay, thanks very much. Um, thanks for the invitation. Thanks to Tisha and Audrey and Sven. Thanks to Dieter for masterminding this. Um, happy to be here. I am dizzy, but <laughs> <laughs> I think I am. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the North Americans go up first on the first day. So. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I should say also that I should thank proleptically thank Dieter Schoenecker for dealing with this paper, which is very drafty. Oh, I shouldn't thank him maybe until I hear what he has to say. <laughs> but, um, we'll see. but it it is not a. I mean, it's me trying to sketch out a position before dealing really with the secondary literature and any of the texts. Um, so take it in that spirit. Um, I'll try to fill it in later if it seems to go anywhere. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we know that Kant has this picture according to which there is this general species of holding for true, for Wahrheit, and, and lots of different um, subspecies. It, if we had a marker that worked, I would write some of them down, but that's coming, and I will when it comes. Um, but Kant seemed to think that there are norms on the different kinds of ascent. So what's a norm on ascent or on belief? I mean, a familiar one in contemporary and 19th century and, in a way, early modern epistemology is evidentialism. We ought to, in believing, somehow proportion uh, the confidence of our belief to the evidence. Uh, Clifford, in his famous formulation, says it's wrong, and he means morally wrong, always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence. Uh, that's a strong position, and there are lots of different ways to formulate evidentialism, and not all of them are moral. So Kant uh, has a species of ascent that involves firm confidence, and maybe I'll just go ahead with this illegible marker, should I? It's fine. Yes, I okay. know. Okay. Um, I mean, if it's totally pointless to do this, just tell me. That. So here's Favar Alton, and we've got uh, what Chris was mentioning, Minum over here. This is not objectively sufficient and not subjectively sufficient. We've then got, uh, let's see, Uberleidung, so persuasion. This is not objectively sufficient, but the subject erroneously takes it to be subjectively sufficient and takes it to be objectively sufficient, so it is subjectively sufficient in that sense. Um, that's always a mistake, persuasion. And then there's Überzeugung, or conviction, the English translation. And that is always objectively sufficient, so it has, um, well, actually, I don't want to put that up here, because what I want to divide between practical and what he calls logical conviction. So logical conviction is going to be always objectively sufficient. Um, mere logical conviction is objectively sufficient, but neutral as to whether it's subjectively sufficient. And then knowledge, this one, is objectively sufficient and subjectively sufficient. Practice of is another term for good belief, so glauber. And this is subjectively sufficient and known to be not objectively sufficient. Um, ah, he's a marker. <laughs> <laughs> Um, don't have to get all these details, you don't even have to be able to read it. Uh, I just want to have <laughs> at least this. <laughs> Where we're focusing is over here on Ubatoyong, conviction, which comes in a practical mode. And I'll just call this belief with a capital B, because I don't really like the term faith for this. Glauber um, is a German term. And a logical mode. Um, 
And one of the questions I've had and that people have raised is whether there's really room in the taxonomy for a mere logical conviction. So this would be firmly held belief that has good grounds, but we're not subjectively sort of citing or aware of those grounds in such a way as for it to count as knowledge. Um, and I've always sort of thought, yeah, there's room in the taxonomy for that, and it makes sense of the attitudes of certain kinds of agents, children, maybe cognitively impaired agents who just can't reflect on their grounds or be in a position to cite them. Um, so I wanted to say that if there's room in the taxonomy and that it's permissible, now I'm still thinking there's room in the taxonomy, but maybe it's not permissible given some of the things that we're going to say. Um, so <clears throat> on the handout, you can see the condition or the norm conviction. And because we've got two species of conviction, practical and logical, it's got this kind of strange format. Permitted to assent to P with a high degree of confidence, that is permitted to have a conviction if the, condi the conditions on logical conviction or practical conviction are met. So what are those conditions? Logical conviction, this I think really is pretty close to what contemporary people want to call belief. Um, this just has to, if it's permitted, permissible, have <clears throat> objectively sufficient grounds. So some kind of evidence or argument on the basis, on the basis of which the assent rests. So there's a resting condition as well. I've argued um, in a series of papers, most recently one last year, called Kantian Fallibilism. Uh, somewhat controversially, I guess, or at least nobody seems to agree with me, um, <laughs> that Kant has room for objectively sufficient assent, or assent based on objectively sufficient grounds that does not turn out to be true. <coughs> So you can have very good reason for thinking that P and still P turns out to be false. Yeah. It seems like a very natural thought, but there are a lot of infallibilists in the Kantian literature who think that for Kant, you can't get objectively sufficient grounds unless somehow the truth of P is entailed. Uh, so I want to resist that. And then this point about <clears throat> mere conviction and whether there's a place for it and whether it's permissible. Um, and I think I'm going to end up saying there's a place, but it's not permissible after all. Um, practical conviction, on the other side, this is Glaube, has something like these four conditions. So it has to be logically coherent um, proposition for or against which you either can't or at least presently don't, given your situation, uh, the doctor case and the canon, you could in some nearby possible world, but you don't, in fact, have enough information right now to make the diagnosis in the mode of knowledge. You have to act, so you have set an appropriate or morally required end, and a necessary condition of, in this case, acting or attaining the end is having firm assent to something like P, the P or relevant alternative, and P is that for which you have the most evidence, if you have any at all, and in a lot of these cases you won't have any at all because we'll be talking about moral belief about God and immortality and so forth. So to have a conviction, that is to have a firm assent that P, you have to satisfy either logical conviction or practical condition, conviction conditions. That's the picture, that's an example of a normal assent in Kant and a pretty important one. You might want to know, what, I mean, that's what we're asking here, what are the grounds for this kind of ascent? What sort of obligation are we talking about? Um, it seems like in Kant there are three main ways to, to think of norms, or the structure of norms. There's hypothetical imperatives and categorical imperatives. I think categorical imperatives can be theoretical or practical. Maybe hypothetical imperatives can be theoretical or practical too. As I have it here, it's just hypothetical. Um, we have to follow the norms because doing so allows us to reach some other end that we have set for ourselves. So like the end of acquiring truth or avoiding falsehood, that would be an important alethic end. And you might think some of these norms help us to get to 
truth or avoid falsehood and thereby have a kind of, well, norm status, normativity for it. Um, survival, of course, might be an end. Achieving pragmatic ends, so that now we're not talking about pragmatic belief with a capital E. Um, finding rest in our speculative inquiries, so that's, I think, how we want to explain doctrinal glava in the canon. And sustaining commitment to coherent moral projects, that would be moral faith or moral belief. So, a lathic, pragmatic, pacific, finding rest, pacific, or moral ends, which might be such that they motivate hypothetical imperatives. <clears throat> Categorical imperative would be different, of course. It's not about means to end, but rather just you ought to follow this norm. And as I said, it looks like that can come in both theoretical and moral forms. Um, so in a way, one of the things we're trying to talk about here is the structure of the norm. Is it hypothetical or is it hypothetical or is it categorical? That's a different question from the question about the value of um, the ascent, so, or the value which sort of motivates the norm. So there are a lot of different things that could be valuable about ascending in a certain way. <clears throat> One of them is going to be, of course, uh, truth. But there might be other ends as well in the mode of glauba, where you have other kinds of ends. So the end might be valuable, but also the sort of form or way that you form the ascent could be valuable. So here, think about the ethical case. Like when we will to do something, when we act, there might be value to the end, or maybe not. Maybe what's actually of unconditional value is just the form. The structure by which the by one the structure, but the um, the way in which the maxim is formulated, and whether you're doing it from that maxim, from the moral law, as opposed to just in accordance with it. The end, the constitutive end, like the highest good, may have some value, or it may not at all. We can debate about that. Um, and then I guess there's also a question about promotion or maximizing. So do we, once we have some sense of the value in question, do we then try to maximize it or not? And the consequentialist will say yes. And typically Kant's going to say no. So it's important to have these sorts of um, considerations distinct. With respect to value, there's a sort of big picture background debate here that could be useful to bring in. Some people discuss the value of truth and the veritists say that truth is the only final value in the region when you're thinking about belief. Um, the non-veritist is going to say, well, truth is a value, but there might be other values here. Maybe the way you're getting to truth is also valuable. Maybe there are other ends in the region. And the anti veritists will say, truth is not even of value in this context, whether we're getting to it or not. So, so what's Kant's view about this? This is the middle of page two. Um, friends of the human race and of what is holiest to it, accept what appears to you most worthy of assent after careful and sincere examination whether of facts or irrational grounds, and we do not dispute that prerogative of reason, which makes it the highest good on earth, the prerogative of being the final touchstone of truth. So that's a pretty unclear statement about a lot of different things. But it looks like Kant is invoking our ability to examine, and even, at least in many cases, carefully and sincerely examine uh, the facts and our rational grounds, <clears throat> so empirical evidence, evidence of other sorts, inferential evidence, argumentative evidence, and so forth. Um, 
But following reason in this way, at least in this passage, looks like it's a means to getting to truth. It's a kind of touchstone. The touchstone language reappears in the canon, as we've already mentioned. Um, it's an indicator of whether or not we're getting to truth. So is Kant a veritas who grounds norms of ascent in a hypothetical way on their ability to get us to truth? That's a silly question because we've already noted, of course, that he's not a veritist about all forms of ascent. I mean, we've got, this is a bad one, persuasion, but we've got opinion and we've got belief. Um, <clears throat> with respect to opinion, he will sometimes say that it's important as a means to the end of truth, as in the case of a scientific hypothesis, which is later confirmed or disconfirmed. But also, you know, it's good to have opinions at dinner parties. And it looks like that has real value, of, real value for sociability. And so the value of that kind of ascent is not merely um, about truth. Belief, so that looks like a non-veritist picture. Truth is not the only final value in opinion formation. Belief. Glauba is valuable insofar as it satisfies various needs or interests. We've seen that. Um, pacific, moral, um, pragmatic. And here the end, I think, to which belief is the necessary means is also not true. So we hold for true, but the end in question is not truth exactly. It's the formation of a firm commitment which allows us to accomplish some appropriate end that we have set. Um, so this has an anti-veritist flavor. Maybe that sounds too strong, I'm not sure about it. There is this complication that, as we saw, one of the conditions of constraints on belief, Glauba, is that it not be such that we do have strong evidence in favor of not P when we form Glauba, that P. And so that looks like some kind of a a lathic constraint, which may make it impossible to call this an anti-veritist picture uh, regarding Glauba. I don't know, I say some, one su suggestion here at the bottom of page two is that uh, maybe Kant's not a doxastic, direct doxastic voluntary without logical conviction, and so if you have a strong evidence for not P, you just can't hold that together with Glauba that P. And so really the concern is just about this kind of psychological fact. But I'm not even sure that's psychologically plausible. I mean, maybe you actually can take yourself to have really good evidence for not P and the practical exigencies of the situation be such that you're still able to form this other kind of ascent voluntarily, that P. Um, in fact, I think we want that in certain kind of cases. Um, someone brought up as a racist thinks that they you know, have all these evidence for thinking that such and such person is likely to have such and such features, but they are at least for moral reasons committed to this other acceptance of you know, that egalitarian things are true. Um, for moral reasons, that looks like a case where maybe you take yourself to have both logical conviction of P and God of um, <clears throat> So maybe it's not full on anti Anyway, what I want to focus on here is logical conviction over here. So that's just, again, what I take to be the Kantian term for what we call belief. So now, when I talk about belief, I'm talking about small b, ordinary belief. Um, and when I talk about big b belief, I'll, I'll probably try to say something like Papa, just to signify that. So Kant might not be a veritist about opinion and drama, but what about logical conviction? <clears throat> So here's the condition again. So setting aside cases in which the condition of belief uh, are relevant, S is permitted to ascend to a proposition P with a high degree of confidence if and only if S has objectively sufficient grounds for P. So more colloquially, you can only have beliefs if you have good evidence for them. That's the norm. So how is this grounded? Is it grounded in a hypothetical way where truth is the end and you're like, well, evidence points to the truth. And so what we're doing here is 
setting up a norm that helps us get the end of truth, which is what we want. Um, only believe things when you have good evidence that they're true. <clears throat> and one objection here is, it looks like a norm like this is supposed to be necessary on the hypothesis that you've set the relevant end. So in this case, the end, let's suppose, is truth. But it does look like there are other ways of achieving truth um, that don't go by way of having really good evidence. So you might just be lucky, that's like the simplest kind of case. Maybe you have middling evidence that your son has survived a fire, some but not enough to really get justified belief, but your strong desire leads you to form this, the firm conviction that he did. And sure enough, you're right, so you're getting truth. But it's going by way of some sort of desire or wish in such a way that you might think something's going wrong. Okay, so revision one. Maybe our end with respect to logical conviction is something like reliably acquire truth and avoid falsehood. That seems compatible with the veritas picture, and then the norm in logical conviction could be hypothetically necessary given that end. And these other methods like wishful thinking or self manipulation wouldn't be reliably producing truth. Um, you wouldn't always be getting lucky. So maybe that's the thought that the end is reliable truth. Um, well, maybe reliability is too opaque. As rational inquirers, we want to have a sense of why and how rather than just that we're achieving our aims. This maybe is what part of, is part of what it means to come out of our self-imposed immaturity. So I feel like I need more argument here, but I think Kant would not be happy with a pure reliableist picture where there's no kind of internalist element. Here's Alan Wood, a good Kantian if anyone is. This reliableist notion of epistemic justification may work just fine to explain the concept of knowledge or maybe one concept of knowledge, but it is unsuitable for explicating Clifford's principle. So Wood is a Cliffordian and thinks Kant should be too, or is. But the whole point of Clifford's principle is to tell us as reflective cognitive beings, when we're justified in believing something, such a principle can be used to regulate our, to regulate our cognitive activities. That is, we, sort of, in the way that Leakes was discussing, we regulating our own cognitive activities somewhat subconsciously, only if we could be sufficiently aware of whether a belief to which it is applied is absolutely justified, that this awareness plays a role in our voluntary cognitive as cognizers. Thus, it makes sense for us to apply this principle only in terms of a conception of epistemic justification that is, to that extent, internalist, a conception such that we're able to specify conditions of the epistemic justification we can employ as critical norm in governing our conduct as cognizers. Okay, that's a bunch of complicated stuff, but I think the thought there seems attractive that a totally reliableist picture <clears throat> of the relevant sort of justification would seem unattractive to somebody who's interested in enjoining us to regulate our belief formation in certain ways. Um, so again, more argument is probably needed there. I think I have in the past had some arguments for thinking, I mean, one is just textual, Kant talks about subjective sufficiency as a condition on knowledge. So it looks like he too thinks that we have to have some reflective ability to say what our grounds are. And mere conviction that's objectively sufficient but not subjectively sufficient isn't going to count as knowledge. So it looks like Kant's got some kind of internalist constraint as well. Um, <clears throat> so let's adjust our principle for belief or logical conviction again with a little bit of internalism. Um, in cases where the conditions on Galawa are not met, S is permitted to form an assent to P with a high degree of confidence if only if S has and reasonably takes S self to have objectively sufficient grounds that is evidence for P. So um, reasonably takes, I mean, actually I think I would want to articulate this in a more, something more like an in a position phrase, so in principle, something along those lines, so reasonably takes might sound too activist, 
and such that with respect to every belief, you have to be sort of reason, reflecting and then reasonably taking yourself to have good ground. Um, I, I like to talk more in terms of having the ability of being in a position to cite your ground. So, why do I think there's a table in front of me while I'm having such and such experience? Um, being internalistically justified or assenting in such a way that it's subject to suspicions, this is now the top of page four, involves having some insight into why it is that we take something to be true. Again, not a perfect estimate. You don't have to do it every time, you just have to be in a position. You don't have to have a perfect ability to understand, like, how does that objective ground render probable the assent to the proposition that I'm basing on it? Um, he even says in the, Ye in the Yesha logic that in most cases of experiential cognition, the weights aren't stamped, so in math maybe they are, and certain other kinds of exact sciences, but typically the weights aren't stamped. So we have to have this reflective ability, but not do that much more. Subject of sufficiency like truth, I think looks like an end in itself, or a kind of, in, maybe better to say, independent value there. Uh, we have a truth independent duty to be inquirers who reasonably take themselves to have good grounds for their assents. That would be true across uh, both practical and logical conviction. Um, yeah, maybe I would want to alter that a little bit for opinion and say something like we have a truth independent duty to the inquirers who either have good grounds and take themselves to have good grounds for their sense or are aware that they don't have good grounds and therefore don't um, assent with a high degree of confidence, something like that. It's just that in the case of logical conviction, those grounds are truth conducive touchstone. So truth is part of the picture, but there's this independent value being a reason or having a reason for your so that principle logical conviction internal would be grounded. It looks like a kind of hybrid grounding, so partly hypothetical, this is what helps us get to truth, and partly categorical. You ought to have reasons for your belief. So what happens in scenarios where the two desiderata come apart? This is objection three. Suppose we're so one way they could come apart is that you have a lot of great evidence, but somehow you're not getting at the truth. So you're in a demon world where you have good probabilistic evidence, and perversely it tends to lead to falsehood rather than truth. Um, then it looks like not following our evidence is the best route to truth if we're aware of this fact. In such a world, the subject could have a great deal of evidence for various propositions, and reasonably take yourself to have that evidence, and yet the propositions would turn out to be mostly false. Um, so the demon's always meddling such that you get this great evidence and then somehow it turns out to be false. Working out the details as to how that would actually go would probably be complicated, but you get the idea. It's some kind of a setup whereby object, objective grounds or good evidence is not reliably leading to truth. I think for Kant, or maybe just in general, what we should say is, look, if you don't know you're in a demon world, then you should just follow your evidence. It's the touchstone of truth. Even if it is not, at least in this world, a reliable touchstone. Um, so the idea is that you'd have subjective sufficiency Without objectively sufficient grounds, you have evidence that is unbeknownst to you, misleading. This might be a kind of persuasion. I mean, it's uh, not objectively sufficient, but you take it to be. Kant, when he's talking about persuasion, typically seems to blame the person and say that they've made some mistake. In this weird demon world, insofar as it's coherent, um, it looks like this person wouldn't be making a mistake, so this is a strange limit case of persuasion, if it's persuasion at all. Um, so she's kind of doing the right thing. She's getting, she's following that categorical theoretical norm to have reasons for her beliefs, but she's not getting a truth. So a practical analog here would be, you're willing in accordance with the moral law, so you're doing the right thing by way of the form of your maxim or your will. But somehow not moving us closer 
to the constitutive end of the, of the moral law, insofar as there's some unperceivable glitch or whatever in the world. Again, you have to cook up the example. Um, so there it looks like, I think Kant's going to say your action still has moral worth. You're willing from duty or from the moral law. It's just that somehow in this weird world, that's not tending to produce uh, approximation of the highest good. Likewise, you're in this demon world forming belief from duty in accordance with that categorical norm to have good reasons for your belief. So you have epistemic worth even if you're not because of the weird glitch getting at the truth. Okay. If you do know that you're in a demon world then, or if it, you, know, you know that it's 50-50 that you're in such a world, then it looks like you've got higher order evidence for thinking that your first order evidence isn't actually reliably into the truth, or truth conducive and so you use that evidence. That's just a kind of standard move there and you would reasonably suspend your conviction. So that's a case where you have good, you have sufficient objective grounds, but you're not getting a truth. What about the other kind of case, so where you're getting a truth, but you don't have sufficient objective grounds? So here's a case called Templeton, um, which I've adopted from Sullivan Berger. <laughs> uh, you can only get a grant to do a lot of further research if you have a firm belief that God exists. You think there's no evidence for that, but manipulate yourself into holding it anyway. You get the grant, and then go on to discover many further significant truths. Moreover, God exists. Um, so here you're getting truth, but without following uh, your duty, and you don't even have objectively sufficient grounds. So a consequentialist, somebody who's like trying to maximize value here, and also thinks that the final value, the only final value is truth, seems, at least Berger suggests, seems to have to say that you have decisive reason to form a kind of irrational belief if you can, even one that you take to be false. Kantian non-consequentialist resistance to this would presumably appeal uh, to something like the formula of humanity or an epistemic analog to it. This looks like you're abusing or disrespecting the most holy thing in you, your rational faculties. It's not getting truth that finally matters, or certainly not the only thing that finally matters, but the way you get there. Again, that way or the form of your inquiry, not the end, is what gives it epistemic worth. So I feel like there I want to do a little bit more. So what exactly is this disrespect? And couldn't the Templeton case involve a kind of indirect or second order of form of respect? I'm not sure, but. That's my sort of initial thought about the case. And if it's right, it looks like a strong form of non-veritism, where the most significant final value is something like the form, rather than even the constitutive end of inquiry. So non-veritism truth might still be a final value, but it's not the only one. And I'm suggesting not even the most important one. Uh, well, maybe, I mean, maybe we should go even further and abandon the hypothetical connection to truth altogether as the source of the norm here. I mean, maybe that's what the Templeton case is suggesting. At bottom, it's not really having subjectively sufficient true assent that is of final value at all and underwrites the norm. Rather, simply having good reasons for your assent is what does it. Um, the norm on this view would be entirely categorical theoretical and not based in what logical conviction can get you. So here's where logical conviction would peel away from practical conviction or glauba, because that looks like it's always about hypothetical means to end. You form the glauba because of the end that you've set for yourself. Here we might be pulling logical conviction away and thinking, oh, it's just a categorical imperative to only believe when you have sufficient evidence in the logical. So here's another formulation, logical conviction internal star. <laughs> in cases where the conditions on belief are not met, so setting aside practical conviction, S is permitted to form an ascent to P with a high degree of confidence if and only if S. Now we don't say has and reasonably takes, but just reasonably takes S self to have objectively sufficient grounds or evidence that P. And the reasonable taking is in the mode of in a position citing ability to cite, like I said before. 
So again, compare the idea in the groundwork that the good will, the will guided by practical reason, is the only unconditioned value. It's not about the end in question. Kant's opposed to grounding the fundamental norms of hypothetical imperatives. We don't follow the moral law because we want to achieve some further end, rather it's acting from reason to be. That is itself of value. There is a constitutive end of such willing, namely the highest good, but promoting that uh, and certainly maximizing that is not of, not what is of moral value. Okay, so summing up so far, my overall suggestion is that the broad categorical theoretical norm on conviction forming practices is to base our holding for true on what we reasonably take to be good grounds, even when those grounds are not in fact truth conducive. So that holds for conviction across the board. And then the variation on logical conviction, unlike Lava, is that the grounds at least have to seem to be truth conducive. When we cite our objective grounds, we have to reasonably take them to be objectively sufficient, that is, touchstones of the truth of what we take to be true. Um, that gesture at objective sufficiency may be sufficient to avoid anti veritism about logical conviction, which would probably be nice. Um, it would be an attractively radical picture to say that Kant is an anti veritist, even about what we call belief. Um, but in any case, it's clearly not a veritist position, um, and not, not a consequentialist position either. So if you're a non-veritist, you think truth has a, a, a value, it's one of the final values, but also the form of your assent, the fact that you're assenting for good, what you take to be good reasons has a value. And um, you're not trying to maximize all values, certainly not truth value, so it doesn't look like consequentialist picture either. So non-veritist, non-consequentialist. All right, so how much time do I have? I can't remember when the problem is. Uh, um, maybe three or four? Three or four, okay. So I let the rest of the handout be a bit more expansive because I thought I might not get to it, but I wasn't sure what Dieter was going to say, so I thought I would have this here. Um, basically, section four, it has a little bit of an alix flavor to it, where it's like, well, a complementary way of grounding this claim um, about respecting your own faculties could also appeal to respect for others' rational faculties. So we're engaged in various communal practices of knowledge and science um, uh, construction, and it looks like even if the end is not, or at least the final end, the only final end is not truth, um, there's going to be reason to go for something like this logical conviction internal star principle by way of respecting the fact that others are also reason following and reason giving um, agents involved in the enterprise of collective knowledge construction. Um, so that's that section. And then the last section is, are these also moral norms? So some of the debate in this little sector of Kant scholarship is about whether fundamentally these norms on sort of epistemic norms are coming out of the actual categorical imperative on the moral side. It looks like O'Neill thinks that. It looks like Sasha Mudd thinks that. And then other people are pushing back and trying to say, no, there's sort of distinct theoretical epistemic norms that are maybe analogous to, but not grounded in the moral categorical imperative. So I guess I think that, although I'm tempted to think that Kant would also think there's a moral obligation. So you could have a moral, an argument for moral evidentialism that says something like, we have these distinct epistemic obligations to possess sufficient evidence for our beliefs. And then we have a moral obligation to uphold our epistemic obligations. So we have a moral obligation to possess sufficient evidence for all our beliefs. And I think both Locke and Clifford would be able to be interpreted this way. So Locke's got a divine command theory, thinks that we, we should use the faculties that God has given to us in such a way that it is. Um, <clears throat> doing what God intended it to do. Somehow God's authority here makes it morally 
appropriate for us or required for us to do what's epistemically required. Clifford, not a divine command theorist or even a theist, appeals to, again, kind of communal goods. The sole and supreme allegiance of conscience to the community is his first principle of natural ethics. The implication that this has for his ethics of belief is clear. We should form beliefs only on sufficient evidence because in doing so, we contribute to the communal good, the collective project of inquiry. There's this quotation at the bottom of six. The conception of the universe or aggregate of beliefs, which forms the link between sensation and action for each individual is a public and not a private matter. <clears throat> it is formed by society and for society of what enormous importance it is to the community that this should be a true conception. I need not attempt to describe. Um, so I think Kant is closer to Clifford on this than he is to Locke, given what I was saying, or at least sketching in section four. Like Clifford, he's not a divine command theorist of the Lockean sort, though he is a theist. Rarely speaks of our faculties as having been designed for God for specific uses, though there are some suggestions of that in the third critique. Um, like Clifford, moreover, Kant partly grounds his norms of ascent, as we have seen, by appeal to the role that our practices of ascent formation play in the collective projects of humankind. I mean, as we have seen, as I very briefly gestured at with respect to section four, um, <clears throat> Kant does not set this in the context of some kind of Spencerian and Comtean account of social evolution the way Clifford does. For Kant, the connection between the norms of assent and moral obligation ultimately goes by way of the theory of respect for our own and others' rational autonomy. So I think there's this categorical theoretical norm to use our faculties in such a way that we're reason responsive and that you can then sort of go further and talk about respecting, even morally respecting, our own autonomy and that of others in such a way that they become moral norms as well. So last sentence, there may be a categorical moral norm here in addition to the categorical theoretical norm on belief and the hybrid of categorical theoretical and hypothetical norms on glauba and opinion. But I think the fundamental norm on belief, small b belief, is this categorical theoretical one to follow what you take to, to have good evidence. Okay, thanks. Okay, next up is Tita Shenika. Uh, do you all have the handout for this mm -hmm. mm -hmm. sure. And as you probably noticed, there is now coffee in the back as well as water. Well, thank you, Andrew, for the excellent uh, paper. Thanks to Sven, uh, first of all, for um, organizing the workshop, and thank you for inviting me. Although I have to say, you put me in a, in a predicament, uh, because now I'm among uh, Kant scholars and experts on epistemology, uh, and, uh, and I know very little about this stuff. But I give my very best. Now, as most to be expected, uh, Andrew comes up with a lot of ideas and great arguments, and I first figured I'd uh, talk about uh, eventualism and, and Clifford's um, principle. But then I, I, I thought, no, I, I tried to smuggle in some Kant. So uh, you have a handout um, in which. Are you begun? There is a handout. Uh, don't read it yet. <laughs> I, I come to it in a minute. Don't 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 uh, don't concentrate on the on the on the handout. We we'll, we'll get to the handout. There is a German uh, a German version uh, of a passage I call P and a passage uh, which is a footnote to P. And P is a passage is a passage that Andrew at least in the paper he sent me uh, in, the, in the sketch uh, calls intriguing and complex. So we we'll talk we we'll talk about this passage and then we we'll talk about the, the footnote and get back to the to the passage. Now, to begin with, uh, let's quote actually the passage that Andrew refers to as well as a footnote which he does not address, and let's make some preliminary textual observations. So now you may read along. Uh, let's call this passage P. Actually, uh, Andrew also read it. Friends of the human race and what is holiest to it, except what appears to you most worthy of ascent after careful and sincere examination, whether of facts or rational grounds, only do not dispute that prerogative of reason which makes it the highest good on earth, the prerogative of being the final touchstone of truth. Now, first a note on this translation. It might very well be a minor issue, but maybe it's not. 
Henry uses Alan Wood's translation in the current edition, although with one crucial alteration. In German, we read am glaubt wird extensscheinend. Now, if you have a look, if you have a look at the German uh, passage, uh, second line, am glaubt wird extensscheinend. Uh, Andrew translates this with worthy of assent, whereas Alan uses the phrase worthy of belief. The later is closer to the German original, but in any case, there is no talk. There's no talk of für Wahrheiten, if the sent is a, the translation of für Wahrheiten. There's no talk of für Wahrheiten or of belief, just of am glaubt für an extent scheint. That is what appears to be most reliable. Also, Ellen's translation suggests, it seems to me, that the examination in question is that of facts or of rational grounds. But this too, I suggest, is misleading. Rather, those facts or rational grounds are what appear to be facts or rational grounds inasmuch they have proven to be reliable after examination and therefore accepted. Let's now turn to the footnote related to P and thus to thinking for oneself, Selbstdenken. Selbstdenken. Here's my translation based on Alan's and Wood's translation, but with some important alterations. So again, we look at the handout. Thinking of oneself means seeking the supreme touchstone of truth in oneself, that is, in one's own reason. And the maxim of always thinking for oneself is enlightenment. Now, there is less to this than people imagine when they place enlightenment in the acquisition of information. For it is rather a negative principle in the use of one's faculty of cognition, and often he who is richest in information, Kantnisse in German, is the least enlightened in the use he makes of it. To make use of one's own reason means no more than to ask oneself with regard to everything one shall to, now Alan says, or translates, assume, in German, however, it's, it's unnamed. So it's the same unnamed as in the, in the SP, named un. Right? So I say, accept whether one could find it feasible to make the ground on which one accepts, not assume, accepts something, all the word that follows from what one accepts, not assume, into the universal principle for one's own use of reason, which is important. It's not the use of reason, as I understand, it's one's own use of reason. This test is one that everyone can apply to himself, and with this examination you will see superstition and enthusiasm disappear quickly, even if he falls far short of having the information to refute them on objective grounds. For he is using merely the maxim of reason's self-preservation. Now, let me make one more textual observation. In the German text, the asterisk for the footnote in P is placed behind truth. That follows from the English translation. Um, but, um, sorry, in, in the German text. Oh, but alas, in the English translation, P ends with the P ends with the word truth, and so one might get the impression that the footnote is a footnote of P as a whole. But it is not, it's a footnote just to touchstone of truth. This again might not be a minor point. For in the footnote, Kant speaks three times of unnamen, accepting, a fact that is lost in our translation, and also once of an examination. And so one could think that this accepting and examination refers back to the accepting and examination in P. But maybe that's not correct. Maybe the topic in the footnote is the relation between thinking for oneself to that touchstone in which thinking for oneself and examination it involves is not to be identified with a careful and sincere examination in P. Or at least, I suggest, such an identification tells us a problem. So what are we to make of this footnote? In the footnote, Kant discusses thinking for oneself, Selbstdenken, and this, of course, is reminiscent of the three maxims of the common human understanding Kant talks about in the third critique, the first of which actually is to think for oneself, Selbstdenken. However, I propose that what Kant says in the footnote is much closer to his ideas in the lecture on anthropology, Menschenkunde, which he held in the winter of 8182 and thus not too long before the orientation essay. In the third critique, Kant strongly, as you know, of course, Kant strongly relates the first maxim of Selbstdenken to the topic of prejudice. In the footnote, however, this topic is immaterial. Now, one problem with understanding the footnote is that Kant does not give an example in order to illustrate what it means to carry out a test 
and, exam and, approval, you know, and examination and approval by asking whether it is feasible to make the ground on which one accepts something or the rule that follows from what one accepts into the general principle for one's own use of reason. That was quote again. Footnote. Now this is different in the 81-82 lecture. There Kant gives the example of someone who tells ghost stories. Kant speaks of the maxim of healthy reason, just as he does in the essay, and of the self-preservation of healthy reason, an idea also present in the footnote. A quote from the lecture, the 81 lecture. The maxim of reason requires that I admit nothing that would deprive me of my reason as soon as I accepted it. End quote. I preserve my reason, Kant continues, by posing the question, that is, by carrying out the test. Quote, can you use your reason here on a regular basis, a regular message, or not? And the answer to this question is, quote again, uh, lecture, therefore, when such things are given, that is, things like ghosts told by someone in ghost stories, when such things are given, I say, I cannot accept it because it would put me in the predicament of believing hundred old women." End quote. In this sense, when I accept the existence of ghosts, quote, the use of reason is abandoned within Haufen Gefallen. End quote. This is, I take it, and putting Kant's sexism aside, what Kant means in the footnote by testing the ground and rule. Now, reading Kant's mention from the lecture also helps to see that the footnote does not provide evidence that Kant proposes as enter reason, at least in the, in the, uh, in the uh, sketch I got, a quote, a communal project of knowledge and Vernunftklaube acquisition. This reading, and also I think it's, it's Sven's reading in the five minute Kant lecture, um, this reading claims Kant's footnote to say, the footnote about Selbstdenken, that my reasons for my opinions must be such that others are guided by the same reasons in forming their opinions. Epistemic reasons are reasonable only if my beliefs formed on their basis, on their basis, can also be believed to be true by other persons. Well, maybe that is true, and maybe even from a country point of view. I don't think, however, this is what the footnote says. For the test does not, uh, does not call for some kind of individualization. Rather, the test is to ask oneself whether one's own ground to accept a belief could be a general principle for one's own use of reason, not for everyone's use of reason, as is suggested in Alan's translation. It is for this reason that this test, as Kant says in the footnote, is one that everyone can apply to himself. Also note that Andrews and Sven's reading fits the second, not the first maxim of those three maxims of the common human understanding. That is, it doesn't fit the first maxim, to think for oneself, but the second maxim, quote, to think in the position of everyone else, by which Kant means that one ought to set oneself apart from the, quote, subjective private conditions of the judgment, end quote, and to reflect, quote, on one's own judgment from a universal standpoint, which one can only determined by putting oneself into the statement of others. But we will hear more about the second uh, next one, uh, uh, very, very short. Now, let's return, let's return to the passage P and how it relates to the footnote. First, recall that the background of Kant's essay in the famous pantheism controversy is the famous pantheism controversy between Jacobi and Mendelssohn about Lessing and Spinoza. Thus, by the facts mentioned, also mentioned by Ben Andrew earlier, but the facts mentioned in P Kant does not mean uh, experiential evidence in general, I take it at least, but what he calls a bit earlier in, these, uh, in, in the essay, those facts that, quote, arise from inner inspiration through outer testimonies, end quote, as well as, quote, from traditions that become obtruded documents, end quote, that is, religious experiences, holy texts, and the like. Kant criticizes the idea, Jacobi's idea, I guess, that in, that in, quote, Kant, intuition, immediate revelation, end quote, God is revealed. As for Vernunftgründer, the other term in, the, in P, as for Vernunftgründer, I assume it refers to the rational grounds Mendelssohn defended in the controversy. So there is a very specific context to what text in Vernunftgründer means, I think. 
There is another place in the essay where Kant speaks about the touchstone of truth. There, on page 140, Kant says that, quote, every belief, even the historical, must certainly be rational, for the final touchstone of truth is always reason, end quote. But reason in what sense? In P, or rather in the second sentence of P, Kant creates a tension between accepting facts and rational grounds, Tatsache und Vernunftgründe, after careful and sincere examination, on the one hand, and reason as the touchstone of truth on the other. For it sets apart in that sentence in B, the second part after the semicolon from the first by saying only do not as well as by stressing reason to be the final touchstone of truth. Andrew says that careful and sincere examination serves as a touchstone of truth. But maybe this examination in P is only a necessary condition for, for what it means to be fantastically rational, internally rational, as Alvin Plantinga puts it. It may and must come first, and as much it is the first rather than the final or supreme, as Kant says in, in the footnote, touchstone of truth. But the final touchstone of truth somehow is reason beyond careful and sincere examination. As mentioned before, the footnote, Kant also speaks of a test and an examination. But since Kant addresses those at the beginning of the friends of the human race and calls them to reason, as it were, it seems that their careful and sincere examination is not the test or examination Kant has in mind in the footnote. But is the touchstone of truth identical with, with that test in the footnote? Two more remarks on the idea of this test or probe. Note first that the German word Probierstein has its roots in probieren, that is testen, and where it says test in English, it says probe in German. Second, it is by no means clear that the touchstone of truth here is a positive tool to find out what is true. As a matter of fact, uh, with a touchstone, in historically speaking, with a touchstone, one can also find out whether something is not, say, gold. In this sense, Kant, in the first critique, speaks of formal logic as a, quote, a negative touchstone, that is, as a tool to find out whether certain claims could be true at all, not whether they are true. And indeed, in the footnote, Kant says that the maxim of thinking for oneself is a negative principle in the use of one's faculty of cognition. For he says, yeah, sorry, and in any case, it seems that Kant identifies Selbstdenken with the ability of carrying out the test. For he says in the footnote that to make use of one's own reason, which is, I take it, Selbstdenken, means no more than to carry out this test. On the other hand, Kant also says at the beginning of the footnote that thinking for oneself means seeking the supreme touchstone of truth in one's own reason. But how can thinking for oneself mean both seeking the test and also to carry it out? To conclude, a thought on autonomy. It seems to me that there is a larger context both for P and the footnote which needs to be taken into account. This context is the third aspect of freedom in thinking. In, in, in the orientation paper, Kant speaks about freedom in thinking in, in three different uh, respects, and I refer to the third aspect here. So again, this context is the third aspect of freedom in thinking, Freizedenken, that Kant introduces just before P. That is, quote, the subjection of reason to no laws except those which it gives itself. Andrew does not address this context, but I think it would come in handy for his thoughts on autonomy and dignity in the realm of thinking. Thinking for oneself in this context is not, or at least is only in a derivative manner, meant to be thinking independently of authorities or of avoiding prejudice. It is thinking on the basis of one's own laws, and this could be related to what Kant means in the footnote with the general principle for one's own use of reason. The faculty that these laws stem from is stem from is reason. But reason, it can say SMP, is a good, and indeed the highest good, the supreme good. This, I think, is what is why we should adopt norms of assent in the first place. Last and least, 
Andrew also says that Kant, at least in the paper again, Kant is, quote, clearly not a divine command theorist of the Lockean sort. In some sense, of course, this is true. The basis of the categorical imperative is autonomy. But in some, let's say, modified sense of divine command theory, I'm not so sure. Recall that Kant repeatedly says that we must acknowledge our moral duties as, in Latin insta, that means as far as the, the kind of duty is concerned, uh, as insta, divine duties. It's important, to, I think, to take this seriously. Moral duties are not valid because they express God's will, but they are divine in the sense of having their source in reason, which is God, God's reason and also ours. Moral laws are valid, they are real, and it makes no sense to ask why one should, should abide by them. We do so anyway, inasmuch as we are rational, autonomous beings. But it does make sense to ask why we should abide by moral laws as called categorical imperatives, for this question is raised on the background of the fact that we are not only rational but also sensible beings. And the answer to this is Kant's moral realism. We ought to follow the categorical imperative because moral rationality as such is a good and indeed an absolute incomparable good. It trumps all other goods. By the same token, we could argue or suggest that we ought to follow norms of ascent given that we are, for one thing, rational beings, but also, for another, beings that are lazy, faint-hearted, deceived by donations of sensibility and speculation of reason. After all, that's why the norms of ascent are norms. We should follow norms of reason because our reason is the highest good on earth. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dieter. Um, there's a lot there, and I, I hope you'll send them to me so I can like, work through a lot. But, um, let me just, I mean, just to, yeah, I don't want to take the whole time responding, so let me just say, I mean, about, about P, so that I didn't like belief there because I feel like that's um, uh, not even, it's sort of not clear where that fits in the taxonomy that we get in the logic and the canon. So I did change it to assent. Um, I mean, Glauba would be a terrible translation there, but Glauberdixton could be most reliable, appears most reliable, Glauberdixton shined. Um, but I don't think that would change the way I was reading it, right? So it's the kind of assent that uh, in this case, feels most reliable, so that would be restricting now to the kind of logical conviction zone and looking for, after sincerely and carefully examining, what looks most reliable to us. Um, maybe worthy of conviction would be a good, a good thing to say, because that's the kind of ascent that, um, that relates to reliable, reliability considerations. Um, Facts and rational grounds, yeah, maybe that's, maybe the context there is right, maybe this really is like, not just any kind of experiences, but shanghai and other kinds of appeals to inner, inspir inner inspiration and so forth. And then, you know, rational grounds, arguments in general, but in particular Mendelssohn's arguments about this dispute. Um, I do want to ask about the assume versus accept question because I'm in Germany and I want to know like what so I've heard from Chris many times that I should translate on name as assume assumption on um, and now Dieter is saying it's accept and I've always translated it as like accept and I think typically when you see on name or sometimes on nama it's like a synonym for glauba and so accept is nice um, so I want someone with authority <laughs> to <laughs> autonomously tell me what they're doing. <laughs> You've got to think of the other connotations in English of accept, accept right? Or, or it also means to take upon oneself. Right. right. Accept. Yeah. I like that. So that's why I've always translated on the English. Yeah. Correct. I mean, one thing why I like the assume uh, translation yeah. is because you not only use in the case of belief, but also in the case of hypotheses, which are sort of ascending inferences. And then some in uh, the logic lectures, I think there are passages where you contrast it with subsumption. So you mm -hmm. have assumption, subsumption. I think that's neat. 
but I, I, I'm not sure entirely like what's at stake if we agree, like what we want these terms to mean. I mean, assuming can just sound kind of weaker. Certainly yeah. in English, it sounds a yeah. lot weaker. So it may not, even yeah. if it's voluntary, it need, yeah. need not be this active by. Right. Right. Um, and then you know there is the verb use versus these nouns that they sometimes use, much more rarely used. It's going to be context sensitive. Right. That's every it. time, especially with Kant. Yeah. Yeah. Just very quickly, yeah. uh, uh, look at that again. And <laughs> but clearly here, clearly I think uh, uh, it's not, what can, can does not mean annehmen as we speak in German, annehmen, or I actually mean annehmen as well, I assume in English I think it is, and that's why assuming is I think is quite, is quite misleading. Right. Uh, and secondly, again, I end up on the point, uh, can, can, send, can says in, in, uh, in, in P, nehmen an, is annehmen, of course, right? and, and so uh, if, you, if you translate annehmen, which appears three times in, in, in the fourth note, then yeah. uh, an English reader, if you don't read German, you get lost because you don't see that there is a that there is a connection between and them, right? Which also might be, which I try to argue for, uh, which might be misleading in some sense because the explanation of what was is different from the put, put the explanation in the in B. So it's a complicated yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right about the context determining the right English translation in a lot of cases. And then just the last thing I I mean there's so much more but um yeah, it's interesting to think, so you're suggesting that Sven and I have assimilated where Kant is talking about the first test or the first maxim to the second maxim. So thinking thinking for oneself, you're thinking thinking for oneself can be, can take much more about my own subjective situation into account and then think, is this a good ground for me for that on which, that which I'm basing on it? And that's going to end up giving a different result than the question, is this such that other people could, in similar circumstances, base the same ascent on these grounds? That's the part I wasn't getting though, because I mean, it's all about what it means to say in similar circumstances. So I guess I was thinking that test looks like if you're, if you have all of my evidence and my um, background conditions, could you take this ground to be a good ground for your ascent. And then I think it looks like it's the same question after all. So I guess it's all about like what, if, and when we talk about the second maximum, we'll agree about this, right? But like, right. But what do we abstract from? Right. Yeah. But then, but then if, that's, if that's true, then there's a difference between the first and the second maximum. Yeah, it just be. Uh, seems not probable. So mm -hmm. we'll hear about this. Yeah, we'll hear about it. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. There's a lot more. Okay. Thank you.